So, the, uh, let me give you a little uh, history on this thing, because this is kind of weird, uh, how this came to be. Uh, a, a number of months ago, we had an election, a year and two months ago, and one of the first things that happened when the new government came into town, like uh, gunslingers from the West, is they just started shooting stuff. And, they, and mostly what got shot was anything that had anything to do with the environment. Uh, programs were cut and slashed and burned, and, and, and these programs, by everyone's account, weren't doing enough. And so the, the obvious and quick solution to that was to just get rid of them and then replace them with nothing. <laughs> very, very cynical type of politic, a very unfortunate type of uh, set of decisions. Over the course of that, Harper needed to put something in its place. And I can remember, um, I should tell this story, it has a bit of a, a this one small part of uh, rudeness in it, but you'll permit me. I got invited over to the, uh, I know the anticipation builds now, it's not that bad. It's not that bad, I won't offend delicate ears. But I was, uh, I was invited over to the English ambassador's residence for lunch. La <laughs> I, I don't often go to these things, but um, the, the, the Prime Minister's right-hand man was, was coming, the Deputy Prime Minister. And I'd heard some interesting things about him. He'd been wrapped up in some scandal, and he was a Welsh miner, and they're always interesting to listen to. And I thought, okay, I'll go to this. And he wanted to talk about climate change, because England has been taking a very aggressive approach to dealing with greenhouse gas emissions. And leading the charge in Europe who is now dedicated to reducing by 20%, potentially 30% on top of their target, throwing down a challenge to the rest of the world. And so I went and saw this fellow, and he's a grumpy little Welsh guy, and, and we sat around the, this big, long table in, in this residence, and beautiful bay window looking out over the Ottawa River. And around the table with me were about seven or eight ministers from Harper's cabinet, Jason Kenney and Ron Ambrose and Gary Lyon and all these big wigs, Jim Prentice and all these big wig ministers. And they had been whispering in my ear all along that, that we were going to bring in, as the Conservatives, we're going to bring in this really aggressive environmental legislation. It's going to be so good. It's going to be so tough, Nathan. You're going to vote for it. And one after another, they'd been coming to me over the week saying how impressed I was going to be with their act. And I said, Bring it on. <laughs> I can't wait. It is going to be exciting. And so as we sat around the table, this, this, uh, this fellow said, what's going on in Canada? Why, why aren't you doing more? Why have you abandoned the international process that we've all involved ourselves in? Because climate change as an issue is truly global in nature and the effort has to happen at the global stage. And, and one by one, the ministers went around the table and said, we're a very cold country. We're a very big country. The challenge is too great, the task too difficult, and what can we do? Sorry, can't help out. And it, and it came to my spot, and I've been listening, and, and he turned to me and said, you're a, you're a new Democrat, what do you think? And I said, you know, I look, I, I look out that window, and so everybody at the table looked out the window. It's amazing how you can lead politicians if you just direct them. <laughs> and I said, there's the river, and there's the beautiful forest, and there's all these, this, this gorgeous part of our world, of, you know, this beautiful place. I'm so proud to be Canadian, because part of that pride is our natural environment. And I said, I think the decisions we're making now uh, uh, make it unable for me to promise and commit to future generations. That, that's still going to be there. And I come from northwestern British Columbia. And we have watched our forests absolutely devastated over the last number of years in ways none of us could have imagined. That our foresters are now predicting no pine trees in British Columbia by the year 2040. Not a one. And when I think British Columbia, one of the things I think about is pine trees. It's a nice association I have, because they're nice. And they're going. My communities are being devastated right now economically, ecologically, and the foresters from whatever political affiliation have said they directly connect this. In fact, we don't get winter proper anymore. We don't get the cold snaps that we used to get. And we've never seen anything like this. And so I said, I can't, I can't commit to the future generations that that's going to be there. And, and, and this fellow said, hmm, very interesting. And so then he picked his head back up and he looked around at the, the conservative politicians there and he said, so you don't think you can do it? And they all went, no, 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 can't do it, can't, can't, won't, won't do it. And he said, you're, you're cold. And they said, yep, yep. It's a cold country, and you're big. Yes, we're a big country. <laughs> and if you'll forgive me, he said, 
That's the biggest load of bullshit I've ever heard. <laughs> Pardon my French. And all the, uh, the, 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 the forks and knives dropped on the tables, and, and I was sitting beside a couple of his staff, and they just kind of put their head down. <laughs> and I said, he, he's done this before, hasn't he? And it was a beautiful moment for me, aside from the profanity, because what it said was there was some truth speaking to power. It was a moment of truth saying, just giving up. And putting a bunch of excuses in the way is not good enough for the issue that we're facing on a global scale. So they brought in their act. And, uh, and an act is most appropriate in this case because it was an act. It was, I almost imagined Ron Ambrose was going to come out with juggling balls to try to sell this thing because they, she stood at the, the podium and they had the Minister of Health. And just off to the side, there's some pillars. And all the media were out like you folks are right now. And all their cameras and stuff, and here's the clean air, and they have the nice little printed sign saying, you know, clean air. And, and I was stuck behind uh, one of the pillars in the foyer of the House of Commons, and I had just been given the act. And I was reading through this thing, trying to find the punch, yeah. the, this is when it happens, and I'm flipping pages, and they're chatting away on their speaking points and how wonderful they are and how committed the Prime Minister is. And I'm still flipping, and then I get to it. And it says, real action, real decisions will happen in the year 2040. Yeah. <laughs> See ya. And I thought, they just made this way too easy for me. <laughs> there isn't any nuance in this. There isn't any challenge in this. So as they finished, I just stepped in front of the podium. Or behind, I should say. And in the front, the, the conservative staffers were trying to rip off the clean air conservatives are great stickers that they'd stuck onto the podium, but they couldn't because the media started filming. And I said, this is just unacceptable. This is irresponsible government in action. The, the proposal to delay serious action about greenhouse gas emissions in this country until the year 2040 is not right. It's just not fair to the generations coming. And I remember the CBC on the news that night, they had a clip of a fellow in a, in a playground and the news reporter just came up and said, you know, the Conservatives have done this thing, and the environment thing, and it's going to happen by 2040, 2050. And I remember the clip because he had his, his kid, his little kid on his hip, and, and, he's, and he sort of looked at what she handed him, and then he looked at his kid, and, and this guy was about my age, maybe a bit older, and he said, he'll be older than me when this thing really starts to kick in. Is that what you're telling me? And that really stuck. That, really, that image really stuck for me. Because here's this guy trying to raise his kid, right? You know, make sure he gets out and plays and eats right, get him into school, do all those things that we're supposed to do for our children, and we're going to leave him a planet in a total state of chaos and disaster. You can save all the RESPs you want, you can, you can do you know, all the things you can for your kids, but if you leave that mess behind, it's like showing up at a camping site. You ever done this? And you come in and it's beautiful and you've canoed or you've hiked or you've just had a nice walk and you get to this beautiful camping site and you look down and it's just littered with crap. There's pop cans and broken things and bottles and you think, who'd do this? Who'd come all the way out here to enjoy this and then leave that behind? That doesn't seem very nice. That doesn't seem very right or fair that I gotta kinda clean this up. And I think on a global scale, that's kind of what we're doing right now. On a global scale, we're saying, sorry, can't be bothered to pick up the mess. It's just too difficult, we're too big, we're too cold.